Hello, everyone. We're just going to wait a moment till people sign on here and, and uh, participants have an opportunity to join. So let's wait just a, a couple of minutes. Well, not even a couple of minutes. Um, and Stuart, thank you for joining us from the Eastern Shore of Maryland, right? That's where you are now. Exactly. Yep. We're hanging out here, sheltering in place. Sheltering in place. Great. Right. And are you seeing things start to open up there? Not too much. No, not too much yet. You know, every, every, everybody's behaving. They're wearing a mask and, and so forth. And yeah, the traffic at the grocery store, we don't go very many places. I go over to see my mother. She's 100 years old. I go over to see her. Wow. You know, We're knocking on wood here. Yeah, yeah. And so, but yeah, opening up a bit. But they're being conservative, I think. Good. Well, thank you for joining us on The Way Forward. And I'm joined by Vice President Dr. Monique Drucker, who is going to, um, we're going to volleyball between us in asking you some questions to learn about where the hospitality and travel industry is in general, and also um, how Choice is responding to that. So Monique, you want to take it over? Sure. So welcome, everybody. I'm excited to be here. And thank you still for joining us. Um, let's just start out with your own personal journey. You've said that you had no interest in business and you began as a history and liberal arts major and you briefly studied religion. You ended up doing an MBA and you started at the lowest levels in your father's business. And yet here you are. So can you talk to us a little bit about how that journey evolved for you? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I was always interested in business because my dad uh, was a was a plumber to begin with. When I was a kid, and and he was always doing something entrepreneurial. When by the time I was seven, we I'd lived in six houses or apartments because my dad, after the war, uh, borrowed five hundred dollars from his father-in-law and uh, bought a house because he figured the value would go up. Built an apartment in the basement for the family, and then. Uh, um, rented that upstairs out and then sold the house, went up in value, did it again and again. So by the time I was seven, he lived in six houses. So I always had this, and then he drove a taxi at night as well as being a plumber. And so I always had this exposure to a guy who was, was hustling and trying to make something happen and make something of himself. And so that's really, so I always had an interest in business. Uh, at, at dinner table, at dinner time, family dinner nights, we'd have every night except for their bowling night once a week. He would uh, want to talk about his business. And I was the most interested listener at the table, as it turned out. And he knew that and he got a lot of satisfaction out of sharing all that with me. So I always had an interest in business. But uh, when I cut a deal with him, he, he wanted me to go to college on the East Coast and I wanted to go to the West Coast. And Finally, he said, well, look, you can go on the West Coast, but you got a major in business. So I said, well, okay. So I took a couple of business courses my first year and, and, and I said, well, I'll get a double major. I wanted to be a history major. So anyway, I took uh, a couple of business courses. I said, no. Uh, but, but then I became student body president my junior year and I kind of liked bossing people around and being in charge. And, and so I decided, you know, business school might be great. So that's, I don't know if that's, then my 20s, I don't know if you want uh, this to be a filibuster, uh, Dr. <laughs> Parker, but in, in, my, in my 20s, I really, um, one might say floundered. I'm sure my folks thought I was floundering. I mean, uh, after, after graduating from college with a history major, I, uh, I hitchhiked uh, like 8,000 miles across Europe through the Iron Curtain and Istanbul and back. Uh, I, I went to graduate school in theology and in uh, business, as you said, for three and a half years. I uh, built five houses, some unsuccessfully and, and a couple successfully on, on spec. Uh, I ran for the state Senate unsuccessfully. Uh, so, I mean, I just, I just, uh, I even got married and divorced. I, I, I fit that in, in, in my, in my twenties as well. <laughs> so, so I had a, uh, a variety of experience, which, which, uh, but, but I was always interested in business and I had taken a job with my dad and I, 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 it excited me. It was fun. I wonder if I can just follow up on that. Um, you, sure. you spoke about going to college 
And since, you know, we're um, all have a vested interest in higher education and, and I have a little bit of experience working with student body presidents. Um, and I'm wondering about, as you said, you, you accomplished and, and had a lot of experiences in your 20s, but is there a lesson that you have for some of our younger students who often enter college or thinking about going into college and they're just not quite sure how they want to start out? Um, is there anything that you look back now that you could share with our um, community at Quinnipiac and those who are joining us? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, uh, the when, when people ask my advice, and, not, and not very few do, uh, young people, <laughs> I always suggest that when they go to college to to take a broad array of courses and, and, and some perhaps outside of their comfort zone to broaden their perspective as opposed to just focusing in on one uh, uh, one, one subject, uh, one or two subject areas, uh, because out in the workforce, and, and that's why it's good, I think, in your 20s to spend time trying this, trying that, getting to know yourself and what you really want to do and, and understanding yourself. Um, because the people that we hire, uh, for example, Choice Hotels, half our employees at Choice are in technology. And but we look for, for technology people who have a broad understanding of this ever-changing and rapidly changing world and who are curious about the world. And, and so the, the broader their previous experience, the, the, the better, because we want them to get in and understand our customers, their needs, uh, understand our business, and how we can apply technology to, to satisfy the needs of the customers and advance our, our business. So I don't know, is that responsive to your question? It is, yes, thank right. you. Okay. Uh, I'll jump in now and, and talk about another aspect of your career. You mentioned that you ran unsuccessfully for the Maryland State Legislature, but you were actually successful. You later on, what, I think like a span of seven or eight years, you were in the Maryland State Legislature. You ran for Congress. You even thought about running for governor. Um, all the while, and, and we'll get to Choice Hotels in a minute, all the while, while you were really uh, very significant in your uh, leadership role at Choice. So what took you to being a public servant? I mean, what was it that attracted you? I heard that you were student body president, but there was clearly something within you. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I was raised in this religious uh, environment. I went the the only uh, non-religious schools I ever went to were it was kinder, public school and kindergarten and UCLA, two years in business school, because a year and a half later, I, I went to the, uh, divinity school for a year and a half later. Yes. So, so this this idea of service was was important. and And that combined with just an ego that needed some attention a desire to kind of be, you know, up out in front a bit, uh, motivated me to want to want to pursue politics because politics can be the pursuit of justice. And it's, you know, often not, but it, when it's at its best, that's what it is. And, and there's tremendous inequality, obviously, in our society. And, and that was always motivating to want to get in and try to find a way to make a difference uh, in the, in the state legislature and in Congress, which, which, you know, uh, I, I ran unsuccessfully in the, in the, uh, a nice gal, a Republican, uh, defeated me. We were, we were good friends. Uh, we we're still friends, but not quite as good as we were before she defeated me. Well, she, she's an iconic member of Congress, Connie Morella. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so let's turn to choice hotels. And I want to remind the audience that you can, let us know your questions and, and we'll put them in front of Stuart. Uh, so Choice Hotels today has over 7,000 hotels, 11 brands, hotel brands in 40 countries. And you, you've made a shift early on in, in your father and your life, you owned hotels, now it's a franchise model. So, so talk about what Choice Hotels is as, as, a, as a corporation, as your business model. Yeah, uh, actually, actually, uh, the predecessor to Choice, uh, you know, as as you pointed out, Judy, owned uh, hotels, and we also franchised hotels. But it wasn't till the 1970s, uh, in the wake of the OPEC oil embargo, that we decided, look, and and, and at that point, 
most of our cash flow <laughs> uh, came from owning and operating the hotels as opposed to franchising. But we almost went bankrupt in, in the 70s because of the OPEC oil embargo, but not just because of that. Uh, it was a crisis like the pandemic is a crisis today, but because we had made a number of boneheaded decisions uh, as business people and had trouble recovering. And it's only because the bank stuck with us that we did. Uh, but, but like every crisis, crisis, a crisis can bring clarity and opportunity. And the clarity that brought for us was, let's get the hell out of the owning and operating if we ever survive this thing. I decided let's get out of this, this business and just franchise because the cash flow of the franchise was pretty damn stable. So that was, that was pivotal. And so that's why we had the asset light business model we have today. We have about $50 billion of real estate uh, among the 7,000 hotels that we don't have any capital invested in. So, uh, you know, and, and Choice Hotels has, I'm bragging here just a bit, uh, has made money, uh, that the, the franchising business of Choice Hotels has made money each of the last 50 years. And up until this year, the earnings have increased, franchise earnings have increased every single year except 2009, uh, during the height of the uh, global financial crisis. Uh, well, I'll ask you in a moment where you project it to go this year, but let, let's just talk a little bit about the industry model. I, I, I saw a report out of the American Hospital and Lodging, Hotel and Lodging Association, six out of every 10 rooms in the country is empty. Uh, many of the hotels are owned by small business owners and revenues are down 70%. May, they may go out of business. Uh, employees of hotels have lost um, billions in wages. So what's happening to the industry in general and specifically to choice, especially given your franchise model and that your asset light? Yeah, I mean, April 5 was the lowest point of our overall occupancy in North America. It was 28% on April 5, the lowest occupancy in the history of the company. And, uh, and, 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 and but, but the industry at that point was 21%. So they were, they were seven points below us, their occupancy. And that's because we focus on leisure travel. Two thirds of our business is, is leisure travel as opposed to corporate business travel. Uh, it's because we have a lot of mid-scale, mainly mid-scale hotels. It's because we have a pretty large extended stay business, which today is running 70, well, actually during that period, ran 70% occupancy. So that lifted us up. And we have drive to locations, Judy, you know, as well, as opposed to, uh, you know, airports and city centers. Uh, by, by so you're way. saying that the leisure traveler was not as impacted, or is it because of extended stay, was not as impacted by the crisis? It's, as both. It's, it's, it's both. A lot, of, a lot of people in extended stay, you know, just stayed there to shelter in place, and they're still doing that. And plus, extended stay runs higher occupancy anyway, and we just happen to have a, a large segment of our business that's extended stay. But the leisure travel, and as, as travel comes back, and it's coming back, and as I can't obviously give any numbers that aren't public already, but as of May 31, uh, we've disclosed that our occupancy was 45%. The industry is about 38% at the time. And so we've run ahead of the industry ever since uh, the, middle, the middle of March, uh, but still it hurts. And that's not, that's not great news for our owners of our hotels. These are small business people that have busted their, their rear end to put some capital together. They've often started out, a lot of them are immigrants, started out having their families live in the little hotel, 20, like my dad started, a 24 room motel. And, and they bootstrapped themselves up successfully. And, uh, but now, you know, and, and the average choice hotel has, in North America has 25 employees. So what do they do with those employees? You know, they can't, they can't keep them all. So we've been advocating on Capitol Hill and at the White House and uh, try, trying to help them. We've made 20,000 calls in the last few weeks to the owners, the 6,000 owners, and the calls typically take like 45 minutes because it's a very emotional thing. And so we're trying, we've deferred their, some of their fees and 
and trying our best to understand and meet their needs, uh, which are so critical at this point. Monique? Yeah, I, 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 I heard, you, heard you, say, you Stuart, say, Stuart, April 5th and May 31st is, is that you'll probably have in your memory for quite some time. But now that we're seeing states reopen and business plans um, emerging and, and that maybe leisure travel starting to pick up, I'm wondering now that those travelers are re-aging in the hospitality industry, what is it that Choice Hotels is doing to prepare for the guests and to assure them that Choice Hotels is where they should stay? Yeah, we've, we've rolled out a whole set of new safety protocols because you know, the first obligation here, and this, everybody says it, but I, I think our culture really takes it seriously in our companies is to, is to ensure as much as we can, the safety of our customers and our people serving our customers as well. And we have to live that out. And, and, and that, so, so, so we, we have a whole list of, of, uh, new protocols, not just social distancing, but also optional maid service, uh, you, know, you know, because a lot of folks don't want uh, a maid in their room every day if they're there for more than one night. Uh, also, um, uh, buy, uh, buy and carry breakfast as opposed to a served breakfast. Those kinds of things diminish the amount of uh, personal inter interaction. Mm -hmm. and, so, and, and we have a, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. Yeah. It wasn't a great was, <laughs> Well, we have a, a question from the audience. This might be a great time to insert it, but it was about the emergence of Airbnb and other home sharing companies. Um, and I'm wondering how that's affected your business model. And I guess in particularly now, as even as you described some of the things that Choice Hotels is doing to assure guests, I wonder if is that a competition for you where people might think that it might be safer to just go into an Airbnb or how that's impacting um, your business and your model? Yeah, no, it's a good, it's a good question. I mean, Airbnb up till this point in time has not, we just see it as another hotel company. Actually, our business model is the same as theirs. They're asset light, we're asset light. They don't own any of the homes or apartments that they rent out. Uh, we're, we're a broker, they're a broker. We, we put guests in, in, in bed. That's what, that's what they do. Uh, I think the challenge they may have, they, they've had a nice bump up here in the last few weeks because people have decided, well, hell, I'm going to go and shelter in place at an Airbnb with a full kitchen and, you know, a porch maybe and so forth. Uh, and I'm going to I'm gonna cleanse it first. And, but, but going forward, I think it may be harder for them. I'm not wishing this on them, but it might be harder for them to, uh, you know, impose on all the homes in their portfolio around the world uh, as stringent, uh, safety measures as we're able to do in our hotels, because we have a franchise agreement and that's just part of the agreement they have to live up to and, and industrial grade chemicals to, to clean the, uh, rooms and the premises and so forth. So, uh, don't wish them any ill. Uh, we see them as another hotel competitor. I mean, I mean, that don't tell anybody, but my, my siblings, uh, instead of staying at a comfort inn, they go to an Airbnb. Oh. Wow, that <laughs> might your secret family. safe with us at times. Yeah, <laughs> that might cause some family stress. Now, I, I right. can see your point, uh, Stuart, that in terms of consistency and and following standard operating procedures, that you you might expect a hotel to be more consistent about that. But speaking of competition, what about the competition now from RVs? I understand that in May. Uh, year over year, RV sales were up 170% over the last year, and there's a waiting list because people are saying it's safer to buy my own RV or rent my own RV and cross the country than stay at hotels. Have you noticed any competition from that? Well, that's a good, well, that's a good question. question. I, I haven't really thought about it, and uh, it, it, I'll make a note of it to see how much of an impact it's having on us. But uh, it's a good, it's a good question. My, my guess, Judy is, well, look, we, we need to look at it. My guess is it'll be pretty small, but I've been reading the same thing. I, I agree. Uh, it's uh, it could be a factor. I mean, a bigger factor, I think is there's going to be a decrease in demand for hotels going forward because the business traveler, business travel is going to go down 
international travel into this country is going to go down for some time. Uh, the, the globalization was was decreasing anyway be, before all this. It's going to decrease more. Uh, so there's going to be less international travel. There's there's uh, people are becoming more nationalistic and so forth. So we we think there's going to be an, a higher uh, vacancy rate in hotels going forward uh, for the next five years than there has been for some time. And there's less hotels are going to be built. I mean, last year in 2019, Choice Hotels sold uh, in, in just North America uh, 700, no, 670 new franchise agreements. This year, we expect to sell about th about half that, about 330 or so. And because, it, because half those last year were new construction and the rest were conversions from other brands or independents. So it's, this is gonna be fewer hotels because there's gonna be fewer demand, but the demand's gonna go down quite a bit, I think, because people are gonna be working virtually. And that means that, you know, hotel rooms that cater to the business people, Hilton, Marriott, and so forth, Hyatt, their room rates are gonna to have to come down. And so we, we may lose some of our customers who pay 80 bucks for a, a room, maybe they can get it across the street at a courtyard or a, or a Hilton, you know, for 80 bucks. So, so it's a factor. Uh, so, you know, I'll, I'll follow up on that because I was actually looking at daily flyer numbers. And um, and I wanted and I wanted you to explain the relationship between air travel and hotel occupancy, because um, I, I looked at the last um, uh, three months of daily. You, you can get reports from the TSA, and typically in this period, about two and a half million people fly daily. Um, we're now up to about 500,000 a day. At the lowest point, around that April 5th date that you were talking about, there are only about 90 or 100,000 people flying a day. Frankly, I'm surprised that there was even that, 90 or 100,000, because so many people were really sheltering at home. Our, our highest day in the last three months was actually Thursday, 576,000 air travelers. So that's about... 20% of where we were last year, a bit over 20% where we were year over year last year. So, so you, you talked about some of the effects of international air travel and business air travel. So how do you track that in your business model? Well, well you know, one advantage we have is that we have drive, most of our locations are drive to locations. And we believe that Vacation, vacation. Vacations are going to be uh, much more, uh, you can drive to a local national park or a state park or a local beach, uh, as opposed to flying halfway across the country or across the country to, to Disney World or whatever to take your vacation. And, and that, that plays our way uh, and is positive. We do have a lot of leisure travelers that fly, but we think they're going to still take a vacation and uh, and but but they'll be driving for a while until there's a widely distributed vaccine that people have confidence in if we get to that point. So I'll ask one more question before I turn it back. And this is from the audience. And I, I'll, I'll, I'll generate I'll generalize it a bit. The audience is asking whether during the stay at home period uh, were franchise fees e franchise fees eased to help your franchisees. Um, and their employees. But I also want you to talk about some other financial measures that you took to belt tighten um, as you go through this period. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's tough. Yeah, no, uh, we, we have allowed franchisees in uh, a number of cases to defer what they owe us because of the, the, the bad shape that they're in. Some of that has been across the board depending on the fee and some has been uh, situational. Uh, and this is something we've done over the years uh, during all the, it's been about six or seven I've been around for downturns in the economy. And uh, so that, that is something that we, 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 we've done. We have, we have either furloughed or um, 
let go, I'm afraid, about 20% of our people, uh, which is really hard to do. And um, now, you know, Marriott is in Washington, like we're, we're based in Washington, uh, D.C. area. Marriott and Hilton are based there as well. And they've let about two thirds or furloughed about two thirds of their, their corporate employees. So less with us, partly because of our business model. We, we don't, aren't going to have the cash flow problems that some of these other companies are going to have. Uh, so uh, that's, that's been the big area where we've cut expenses. We had a convention, our annual convention has 5,000, 6,000 attendees. We canceled that because you, we had it virtually last week. Uh, it was only a, a short one, of course, not three days. <laughs> it was an hour or so uh, just to report. So is that, is that responsive, Judy? Yes, it yeah. is. And we're reminding everyone to submit questions. Um, and we're, we're also going to shift into another business that um, uh, the Bainham family owns, and that is in elder care, uh, nursing homes or assisted living homes. But Monique, turning back to you. Thank you. I was just wondering, you mentioned um, briefly about some of the international travel and you have hotels in over 40 countries. So maybe you can speak to what differences you're seeing across the different countries in response to the pandemic and then maybe the travelers' patterns of behavior and um, maybe what you're, you're thinking might be coming. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, the, the travelers' behavior seems to be roughly the same. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not clued in on these different countries, any, any specific. I mean, Western Europe, uh, you know, you, you, you've seen the problems they've had in, in Spain and France and Italy and so forth. Right. And Germany's done well, but uh, it's, it's a similar situation. Uh, we have a higher percentage of our hotels closed that are international. Uh, virtually none of our hotels in North America are closed. Uh, and I think it's what, 15% outside the North America are closed at this point in time, something like that. Don't hold me to that precise percentage. Um, so, you know, only about 85% of our value, uh, we say we're in 40 countries, which is true, it's a, a little over 40, uh, but about 80, 85% of our value comes from North America because our brands are better known and we charge eight to 10%, I think, as I said, of revenues in North America for our brand, depending on the brand, off the top, of the, uh, whereas overseas, it varies by country, but it can be as low as like 12, uh, 14%. Um, of, uh, excuse me, uh, excuse me. It can be a lot lower than 12 to 14%. Uh, in the US, and the difference is the value proposition in the US is in North America, we generate 60% of all the room nights sold to our hotels uh, on average. Some brands are higher, a few brands are lower. Internet in Europe, it's about 14%, you know? So they're just the, 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 the franchise is less valuable, so we can charge less. And, you know, there's opportunities there probably for us that we've been pretty consistently unsuccessful in, in figuring out and seizing. Uh, but do you think that the closures of these international hotels is because they have greater lockdown or because people have just shied away in their own habits? I think they're pro I don't, I don't know specifically, uh, you, you know, a, a generalization would be that, that they probably are weaker hotels in, in a few of the countries. And we have great hotels in Northern Europe, uh, better on average in the U.S., but in some other countries, they, they're weaker, and, and that's probably, and they may stay closed, some of those hotels. So I'm going to shift maybe to talk about this other major business that you all were in, um, and that was um, the elder care business. I mean, you acquired and ultimately grew Manor Care to what is now the second largest nursing home enterprise in the country, uh, and you've since sold that, but you still have ownership in a couple of uh, brands of memory care assisted living facilities. I think it's Artist and um, Summerford uh, brands. And we know that during COVID, these have been very, very uh, difficult and sometimes scary places to be. 
Uh, I think a Wall Street Journal recently report until the numbers we saw this weekend that 40% of pandemic deaths were in uh, nursing facilities. Unfortunately, this weekend we've seen a growth in young people's uh, infection rates. But talk about the, the particular risks and responsibilities that, that come with uh, being an owner and operator of these kinds of facilities. Yeah, I, 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 excellent question. And it's a, it's a real uh, responsibility. Um, Artist uh, Senior Living is a seven-year-old startup. Man Manor Care we got out of in, in 1998. My dad started it. It was a startup in 1998 and became large. And uh, But we've been out of it since 98. And I I want to point that out because it's kind of had a checkered past uh, over the years, the last uh, couple of decades, uh, but it has the same, same name. Uh, but uh, yeah, Artist Senior Living uh, is a pure memory care. Uh, all the residents are private pay, no Medicare, Medicaid. Uh, they uh, all have private rooms. Artist uh, develops, uh, owns and operates these properties uh, uh, completely. And as I said, there's about 20 now. And the key here is, goes back to the culture of an organization. The key the is, is the first, first priority is to uh, do all we can to ensure the safety of our residents and our people caring for our residents, which is a hell of a, a risk for, for them and their families when they go home. Uh, and so, so how do we do that? Well, the first thing we did in March was we contacted all the families, about 850 families, and said, look, one option for you here, and it may be the best option, is to take your loved one home for a while until we see which way this, this whole situation is gonna sort out. Of the 850, only 11 took their loved ones home the reason is because th these residents have dementia and a lot of them have Alzheimer's and they, they can wander around. They wander around a lot and they're very risky to have somebody to, in the home during the night or during the day because they can leave the house and put themselves in harm's way. So, so that was one thing we did. And then, and then the other thing we've done, we're going we're gonna to lose. It's a startup, so we're losing. We were losing money to begin with. We're going to lose $17 million more this year in 2019 than we would have. Uh, and I hope it's only that. I hope it's only the $17 million. Uh, we'll stay tuned. Uh, the other thing we've done is, and happily, I mean, the guy that's running this, I hired for two and a quarter an hour 42 years ago in, uh, in, 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 in Silver Spring, Maryland. And so we're, he's part of the family. And I trust him more than I trust myself. And, the, and his two top operating guys are two guys that we, Don and I, the, the guy I heard at two and a quarter now, that worked with for 30 years. So they've been through a lot of this and they came out of manor care. And um, so, so they are used to combating the flu season. Now this is a hell of a lot tougher than the flu season, of course. Uh, so so we, we formed a safety council and it meets every Thursday and with two, three experts, nationally known experts, two are from Johns Hopkins. They're, they're physicians at, at Johns, Johns Hopkins and clinical uh, professors as well and advise the uh, uh, Centers for Disease Control and so forth. And it's really, they've added tremendous value because this virus, we're, we're just discovering every hour, it seems something new about the damn virus and it affects from week to week how we run our business. And learning that in real time is of tremendous value to our residents and our caregivers. And, and it makes us more efficient financially too, obviously. So they've been, they've been first rate. So we're doing all our, we can and, and we measure, we, the, the bonus is paid by our managers is 40% of it's decided by the customers or by the families. Uh, we tie it to, to that, their annual bonus. And so we got we to gotta put the, the customer first and, and, and in times like this and say, you know, shareholders, we're long-term investors, but you got to be patient. 
Monique, did you want to ask the question from the audience here? Oh, sure. <laughs> it's about testing. Um, yep. Yeah. The question is, how is your company approaching testing at the elder care facilities and all those yeah. properties? Great question. I knew somebody on the board or know somebody on the board of Abbott Labs in, in North Shore, Chicago. And, um, and, and so they, they came out pretty early on with a pretty damn reliable test. You get a result if you're positive in three minutes. If you're negative, you get a result in 13 minutes. There's really no false positives, but there are some false negatives. So we test a, false, a, a negative a second time to diminish the chance we're, we're missing. So we, we've tested, uh, we, 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 we test all of our associates, our caregivers, mm -hmm. and then all of our uh, residents. And we, we got 3,000 tests early on. Uh, and we're, we're gonna keep getting them from Abbott because we're a customer now, but they were really hard to get and the government was really deciding where to go. And I just tried to find out how we could get these and finally lucked out and discovered somebody that I had a very weak relationship with, but they, they came through anyway for us. So you're retesting on a regular basis, yeah. all the residents and all the associates. Yeah. And then we don't, we don't take any visitors. We, we're just a real, we, we closed, you know, we, we didn't take any more residents. Uh, and we just started a week, 10 days ago at some of our uh, communities taking uh, new residents, but we quarantine them for two weeks. We test them first. Uh, we investigate the family to see who they've been around and uh and then any newest and and then and then we do all kinds of other things we take temp their temperatures twice a day uh or no all three shifts and uh and then our em our employees our caregivers we take their temperatures twice when they come and then when they leave and so forth so hopefully you know we we, we the, the bad news is that three percent of our residents since march one have died of COVID-19 that were not on hospice already. And it's a, it's a tragedy uh, and we're embarrassed that it's 3%. And, and currently only 13 of our residents uh, have COVID. They're isolated, of course. Well, four of them are in a hospital and nine are isolated in, in our own residence. Most of our folks have recovered, but uh, you know, it's, the average age is 84. Yeah. Uh, um, Stuart, can I just ask a strategy question? Uh, are there, did, did you get into this business because there are any strategic synergies uh, between the hospitality business and, and, and the nursing home business? No, yeah. no, we just, we, we think we saw an opportunity and had uh, uh, folks that we knew and trusted I mean, the construction people I've worked with for 20 years or so and, and, you know, that, that build the buildings and, uh, and the real estate people finding the sites the same. So we saw it as an opportunity given the demographic trends in the country. Had we foreseen this pandemic, <laughs> I wouldn't have five buildings under construction right now and, and three more about to open and we're just finished construction. Right. So it's a, it's a tough time. If, if anybody, if wants, anybody wants, to talk, wants to loan us some money, we just, you know, I, I'm, 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 I'm available. <laughs> Monique? I can't loan any money, but I can ask you another question, Stuart. I'm wondering um, if we could shift a bit to your leadership. And, you know, you have led the, all your companies as chairman for 33 years. Um, and I'm wondering what the principles um, that have been the bedrock of your leadership have been and and our audience is actually asking some similar questions they they state that you've clearly have a lot of faith in the people that you hire and those who work with you what has been your general leadership philosophy and how have you selected the right individuals and gotten them into the right positions so can you speak to us just about your leadership and and your decision making sure well I, i'm a work in progress and uh and, and always have been and have fumbled around a lot trying to figure things out. I had a great mentor. My dad was the first and foremost, uh, my most important of three business mentors I've had. Um, but, but 
my my view is the if you're running a not-for-profit or a for-profit organization or a government agency it, it, there's three keys in my view one you know what is the and, and this sounds trite but I'll, I'll try to flush it out just a bit um, what's the vision for the organization we're long-term investors we think in terms of decades not quarters or annual report and annual reports uh, what's the vision? In other words, what's the strategy? What's the opportunity given the environment uh, that we foresee? And, and you try to come up with big uh, goals that are exciting to people that'll turn the troops on and help you attract uh, great talent uh, and retain great talent. And then the second thing is, is, is talent, where you focus on, you know, what kind of talent do you need to live this vision out? over time. And then third is what are the values of the organization? It's the corporate culture. What, what, and when I talk about values, what I'm talking about is take the three or four key stakeholders, uh, your, your, your customers, your people, your, your, your associates serving the customers and your owners where you get the capital and the communities in which you, which, which you serve and which you, which you operate. And so just as you have to compete for the most valuable customers, that means you have to listen to and bend over backwards to listen to and understand their, their ever-changing needs. Uh, and and that, that affects what kind of talent you bring into the organization too. Uh, then you have to compete also for the, the, the most talented people. Um, and so how do you find them? And so part of that again is, is listening and, and bending over backwards to meet their need. And last, you want to you want to identify uh, the least expensive capital uh, shareholders and and get along with your community. So, all this is a matter of thinking through their needs. And but the art of it is how do you balance the needs of the, of those three key stakeholder groups so that the shareholders aren't getting more than they should at the expense of the customers or or, or the employees or vice versa. The customers are being taken care of too, too much. And to do that, you need to have a pie that's expanding. You need to have a business that's growing so that it can be shared in an equitable way and you keep, keep the different stakeholders relatively happy. That was a bit of a filibuster, but is that? <laughs> that was great, thank was you. A, Okay. That was great. Um, we're, we're almost at the end of our questioning, and and so my, maybe I'll take the last um, question. Um, you're really well known in in the Washington area and 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 well beyond, as as fantastic philanthropists, um, as people that have really uh, taken care of, of the. I know that started with your parents. And you and Sandy, your wife, have taken the billionaire's pledge to give away the majority of your wealth. Um, how, I mean, there are unfathomable needs out there even before the pandemic and even before the uh, reckoning that we have now with racism. So how do you think about um, the priorities that you will be giving to and uh, both as an individual, but also as somebody who's leading a corporation that has impact in communities all around the world. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean first, um, you know, they, I, I've just been, and my family's just been very lucky to be able to give money away because, I mean, I, was born into a family with two parents that created a, a great home for me. I was born in the U.S. I could have been born in Malawi, which is like the poorest country, the poorest in, the country world. in the world. And we have 4% of our population, of the world's populations in the U.S. So being born in this country, being a, a man as opposed to a woman uh, is a hell of an advantage. Being a white person, uh, able to take advantage of all the white power in this country to the, I'm afraid to the detriment of, of others, uh, imposes a, an, an obligation, I, I think, to try to pay something back. And, and, and then the question becomes, well, wh where, where, do you, where do you allocate that capital? And 
historically we've focused uh, disproportionately on uh, really two areas. One, young children that live in in in, in disadvantaged uh, neighborhoods and have weak schools, um, and and then uh, second. Uh, there's opportunities, and, and we've, we've been focusing on this the last few years more, on bending public policy in the direction to address some of the inequality in this country. Um, and, and then the, the third is really, we, we like this, some of the number of our family members, including me, <clears throat> uh, like the Peter Singer, the, the philosophy pr professor at Princeton, the, he's kind of the head of this effective altruism movement where you know, and, and, and the emphasis there is, you know, you're a, a contribute a dollar in Malawi goes a hundred times further than a dollar in this country. And you're still, you can, you can transform or change a kid, save a kid's life with a lot with, with 1% of what it would take here in this country. And so increasingly we're shifting, uh, a lot of our philanthropic investments, uh, in the, in the countries like that, in Sub-Saharan Africa and India too. Nick? Are, are we time or are we? I think, I think it's time. Oh, we, we, we yeah. are exploiting uh, Stuart's goodwill uh, and we had 45 minutes, we've already passed that. Uh, Stuart, as always, absolutely fascinating and inspiring. Uh, thank you for all of your good work and for the great business person that you are. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. And, and Monique, I mean, I, I, uh, I can't imagine all the challenges you folks are facing in the midst of all this suffering and heartache and, and your team is facing and trying to sort things out. So, uh, you know, good, good luck with all that. And I know it'll turn out well for you in the end and your the students and and the families and and thanks judy for your friendship over the years it's been like 30 years like you said and it's been a and, long time and wonderful and thanks for not making this too hard for me <laughs> <laughs> well thank you and uh, we, we are going to continue to stay in choice hotels and to watch the great work that you do uh, philanthropically thank you and thanks to monique be well thank you bye-bye be well <laughs>